Well, now our next speaker, uh, U.S. Permanent Representative of the United Nations, is Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security. Ambassador Bolton is currently a Foreign and National Security Policy Senior Fellow in the American Enterprise Institute, and his op-ed articles are regularly featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and Washington Times. John Bolton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I wanted to uh, touch briefly today on the situation with Iran's nuclear weapons program because while we uh, quite rightly focus on the plight of the people at Camp Ashraf and focus on the, their larger fate and getting refugee status and getting out of uh, Iraq and, uh, and developments in Iran broadly. Um, I think with respect to the nuclear weapons program, we could be coming to a very, very critical point. And uh, this has to do not with political or diplomatic uh, hype or spin or speculation. It has to do with physics. And the physics uh, have to do with the continued progress that the regime uh, is making toward its long sought objective of a deliverable nuclear weapons capability. Now, it's in connection with the regime's nuclear weapons program that I, I first learned of the MEK. I first uh, saw the work that they were doing exposing to the world information about this illicit activity, activity by the regime that violated their commitments under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty violated uh, their agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency, violated the comments they routinely made publicly that their only purpose in pursuing nuclear-related research was for civil power purposes. And as the evidence has accumulated over the years, uh, what I saw that was classified when I was at the State Department often had a chance to compare to what the MEK was releasing publicly. And uh, uh, it, was, it was really remarkable. Uh, you know, people like myself and government can talk about the threat of nuclear proliferation. It sounds very abstract. When you think about it, it's been 50 years since we've had an atmospheric nuclear test. When I speak to college students and talk about the threat of nuclear proliferation, to them, a nuclear explosion some grainy black and white TV footage from the late 40s or 50s. It's like a different world to them. Now, I'm not suggesting we resume atmospheric testing for educational purposes, don't get me wrong, but I'm saying that the, that the reality of uh, nuclear threats uh, is something that's a little bit uh, distant from people's experience. So to have information about the regime's activities made public, I felt was very important. Um, and I think what we're seeing right now uh, is that this 20-year-long effort by the regime is getting perilously close to success. Uh, we've had just in the past week yet another report by the International Atomic Energy Agency uh, based on information that the IAEA has. It's essentially public information not based on anything we don't know about, but based on what they see publicly, there's already a sufficient stock of uh, low enriched uranium for the regime to fashion into five or more nuclear uh, devices uh, with, with a little bit more work on the enrichment process. The production of enriched uranium, which anyone who knows anything about nuclear weapons would tell you is the long pole in the tent uh, toward developing a weaponization capability. Uh, are proceeding essentially uh, unhindered. New generations of centrifuges, much more efficient, uh, with much greater capacity, prepared to be introduced. Uh, and this progress of building a broad and deep nuclear infrastructure continues. And in the meantime, while this work proceeds right in front of us, uh, the United States, as it has for 20 years, is still trying to find ways to negotiate with this regime. Uh, uh, th this is a faith that goes beyond religious faith. You, you can't find empirical reality that justifies the continuation of this negotiation. There just simply isn't any evidence for it. Let's just look at the current round. 
With great fanfare, the five permanent members of the Security Council in Germany met with the regime's negotiators uh, in Istanbul and had several days of negotiations. And when they finished, they came out and declared it was a great success. Much progress had been made. What was the tangible outcome? They had agreed to meet five weeks later in Baghdad. Well, that's pop the champagne. You know, diplomacy is the only profession on earth where success is defined as having another meeting. And where was that meeting? Baghdad of all places. My goodness, isn't that an interesting uh, selection? So we go to Baghdad and we hear reports that the IAEA is close to reaching agreement over access to the Parchin facility, an armor, artillery, missile base where the regime has undoubtedly uh, been testing the high explosive component critical to weaponization, to taking the enriched uranium or plutonium in the pit of a nuclear weapon, compressing it into critical mass, and creating the uncontrolled chain reaction uh, that uh, the nuclear weapon is designed for. Uh, and negotiations at, at uh, Baghdad then come after this happy news from the IAEA. Of course, there's no signed agreement. And yeah, there are still a few issues unresolved. But it's good news. You can, you can count on that. So the negotiators come to Baghdad. And uh, they have two days of negotiation. And what do they agree to? They agree to meet again. It's another success. Four weeks later in Moscow. Uh, except this time we find by reports in the New York Times, and you know the New York Times is always right, but the New York Times reports that there was, a, that there, this is their word, a frenzy of activity at the end because they couldn't agree on the next city. And they finally compromised on Moscow. You know, maybe the fourth meeting... Maybe the fourth meeting will be in Tehran. Why not? Let's, let's cut to the chase here, you know? What, what is this doing? It is, once again, buying time for the regime to make progress toward nuclear weapons. Time is not a neutral factor in diplomatic negotiations. Those negotiations are like all other forms of human activity. They have costs as well as benefits. And the cost of negotiation is the time that Iran gets to continue to move toward that objective. People talk about the effect of sanctions as having a coercive impact on Iran. What, what effect? The director of national intelligence, the Obama administration's own appointee, testified to Congress two months ago that all of the existing sanctions had had no effect on Iran's behavior or policy in the nuclear field. And the new sanctions we see uh, coming into effect this summer may have an economic impact, but there's simply no evidence they've done anything to slow down the Iranian nuclear weapons program. In fact, if anything, uh, all of the attention to uh, the sanctions, to Stuxnet and Flame, to other covert uh, activities against the program simply divert us from the pressing reality that they are getting closer and closer to their objective. Uh, without even knowing whether uh, there are activities inside Iran, inside North Korea, inside Syria we don't know about. Now, I think the answer here is that this has to be coupled by a uh, declared policy of the United States government uh, and our friends in Europe that not only are we opposed to uh, this regime having nuclear weapons, we are opposed to this regime, period, and it needs to be overthrown. Thank you very much.